Did you know the average human attention span is a mere eight seconds? Or have you heard that statistic is total bull doo-doo? So why did I bring it up? And why did I just bleep the word doo-doo? Is total bull doo-doo. <laughs> because you can't keep someone's attention until you have it. And if you're still watching, it worked. Now let's talk about eight tips for how to keep your player's attention in D&D. Hi, Bob here, and welcome to Bob World Builder. I have a super important announcement, really a mixture of pretty bad and very exciting news that I'm going to share at the end of this video, so please stick around. Now, this week's attention-grabbing topic was requested by Richard Young and chosen by the Bob World Builder patrons. And I hope these eight simple tricks for keeping an eight-year-old's attention during D&D will also work for your players. First, if you've been a subscriber for a while, you probably know my background and how I learned about attention. But if you're new here, hit that subscribe button and let's recap. According to my LinkedIn page, I am an environmental educator. I work at a residential camp that mostly serves middle school students, and so much of my job is about keeping a group of 20 plus sixth grade boys safe, on task, and excited while we explore nature, often without any direct assistance from other adults. So while my job is extremely fun and rewarding, it was extremely challenging when I started, and it's still not easy. But because we focus on character education, most of our training is about how to have engaging conversations. And here's another kind of phony statistic we throw around. Only 7% of communication is verbal. The other 93 is body language, gestures, facial expressions, and tone of voice. In other words, it's not about the words. It's all about how you say them. And this is trick number one. Actually role play. If you present every monster and every NPC as yourself with your voice and your mannerisms sitting at the table, it's a lot less attention grabbing than throwing out a silly voice and wacky gestures and moving around a bit. Don't be afraid to try out an accent and even walk around the table to your players. If you model this behavior of getting into character, you show your players that it's okay to make a fool of yourself during D&D and your cool players will do it too. However, do not be overbearing with this behavior, because getting in their face to roleplay social confrontation can make some players very uncomfortable. So the most important tip is really number two, set expectations. Setting clear expectations is the most important part of my job and our job as dungeon masters. If you invite your friend to play D&D, but you don't tell them your homebrew world doesn't have any beast folk or arcane casters, they're going to be rightfully upset when they show up with an awesome Eric Cocker bard named Barty McFly. Yeah, he might just be in every video now. But the point is, open communication is essential for your players to feel safe, have fun, and buy into whatever setting or adventure you have planned. Ideally, you start this communication in a session zero, but if you're already in the middle of a campaign, that's okay. Because tip number three is check in with your players. Maybe the class they chose just isn't as fun as they thought. Or there's a cool new magic item they want you to incorporate in the game. Or maybe they just need tonight's session to be lighthearted and fun because they're going through something really rough in their personal life. That's okay. But don't leave it up to your players to tell you this stuff. It is your responsibility as the leader of that table to ask them how they're feeling. So check in with your players whenever you get the chance. And whoa, we're almost out of time before tip number four. So remember to use these check-ins to also learn about their backstory and actually include elements from their backstory in the game. Whew, okay, that was close. Number four, use a timer. This one is a no brainer. Nothing gets your player's heart rate going like a room filling with sand, or the walls closing in, or a chase through busy city streets where you actually slam an hourglass down on the table. Except, don't actually use an hourglass, that's way too long. You can set a timer on your phone super easily, and even customize it for the task at hand. Or, try another popular method that I have yet to try, a Jenga tower where depending on how you set up the encounter, collapsing the tower is either really awesome or really bad, but always epic, 
and epic moments are a great way to grab your player's attention. So trick number five is explosions. That's right, things get boring, a building explodes, that tree explodes, their sword explodes. The trick with explosions is that you have to follow them up with something cool. And you can really only use them a few times before they completely lose their luster, and you wake up one day realizing you built your entire filmmaking career around a non-storytelling device. <clears throat> so, if everything is epic, then nothing is really epic. You need to balance moments of tension with periods of calm. You need, tip number six, pacing. This is where D&D's three pillars come in. Steady exploration, rising social confrontation, climax combat, and so on. I'll make a video specifically about combat pacing in the future, but the main tool I use to control the feel of my game is music. I like classic fast-paced Pokemon tunes for combat and acoustic guitar Legend of Zelda for travel and downtime. But if you really want to take control of your game, never check the rules. That's right, if no one at the table can quickly recall how that spell works, you decide what sounds fair and go with it. You're the dungeon master, you are the referee of this game. The critical thing here is to make a note of that ruling, then look it up after the session with your players to see how it works as written, then as a group decide whether the actual rule or the spontaneous homebrew rule is more fun for next time. And okay, we got two tips to go and that super important announcement, so I'm gonna throw in a bonus tip after the announcement for those of you who stick around. Now, number seven is very simple. Snacks and drinks. Proper hydration and calories are necessary for humans to stay focused and energized, and having something to do with their hands might keep your players off their phones. But on that note, do not ban phones at your table. They're a technological marvel for looking up spells and features while other people are role-playing. And the ultimate trick to keep your players engaged at the table, number eight, literally engage your players. You already know D&D is a collaborative storytelling game. So ask them questions that give them a say in the world. What does your health potion taste like? What does that troll look like? And why does fire keep it from regenerating? Or, hey, can you roll a d12 for me? That one will drive them nuts. And now, it's announcement time. Then, that bonus tip. So, that awesome job I described at the start of this video is done for a while. My state government has, for now, prohibited all schools from planning any field trips in the first half of the academic year while we phase out of COVID quarantine life, and this means I'm laid off for an indeterminate amount of time with no pay, and it's a little scary. But the exciting part is that I'm fortunate and privileged enough to be in a position to try using these first few months as an opportunity to go full-time Bob World Builder. This means more time for editing, hopefully more sponsorships, and the big one that can really make it possible me hosting an online D&D campaign for a small group of major supporters on a brand new Patreon tier, open right now. So if you've been following the channel for a while, or you're new here, but you like what I do and you want to help me make it my livelihood, please like my videos, share them with your friends, leave comments, and watch them all the way to the end, even if you skip the ads. Those simple things are what the YouTube algorithm uses to decide which videos are suggested to more people. And smallish channels like this one always need extra help to grow as a community. Another easy way to show your support is to use the affiliate links in the description when you go to DMs Guild or Amazon and buy whatever you want to buy. It doesn't have to be the same item that the link is for as long as you follow through with your purchase in the same session. Also, I have a pay what you want adventure and a PayPal link down there so you can make one-time donations of any amount. But if you want monthly D&D supplements, your name at the end of my videos, behind the scenes content of how I make all this stuff, one-on-one -on -one hangouts with me, and one of the three remaining slots in a D&D campaign starting as soon as possible and completely tailored to the liking of you and the other players, check out my Patreon. 
It's truly the best way for you to support not just me, but this entire Bob World Builder community for which I am grateful every day. So thank you. And as much as that was kind of heavy, here's that bonus tip I promised. Consider your number of players when starting a campaign. My Patreon campaign is limited to only five people because beyond that, it's difficult to prepare content for each player and to give each character their time in the spotlight. And while having only one or two players can make this easy, four to six is the standard because players can better roleplay with each other and keep themselves focused. So find out what works for your group and you'll never have a boring session again. Thank you to Drew Robarge, Tim Creter, and Joe Olivas for joining Patreon this week. Thank you all for your support thus far. It's really amazing and I just can't express how much it means to me. And keep building. <laughs>